just now. Uh, if I was to put it in perspective, I think it was uh, the late 90s, you know, when the uh, print publishers started to disseminate their print journals over CD-ROMs. I think that was the beginning somewhere. And thereafter, of course, in 2000 is a time when the, uh, I mean, if people who were around at that time would remember the famous NASCOM report, and this NASCOM report actually became the basis for many dot-com businesses. So it wasn't technology, it was not the word at that point of time. It was, of course, internet, because internet penetration had just about started. I mean, we had dial-up connections uh, during those times. And uh, so I think the first hold amongst the, after the CD-ROM, uh, CD-ROM-based, uh, uh, you know, case law dissemination, the next hold was essentially the digitized searchable libraries, right? That was, that is what, that is how technology really got introduced and kind of, uh, you know, uh, made way within the legal industry. And I think what happened was that the specificity and the customization which search uh, uh, enabled, I mean, uh, gave to the lawyers, uh, that kind of made the lawyers or the legal industries cognizant of the power and the relevance of technology. And that is when they kind of started to open up, you know, that yes, technology can be an enabler. So that was, but there was, I mean, if I was to remember those times, it was excruciatingly slow pace at which, you know, things were opening up because uh, th that was a time when uh, you had these um, uh, boxed, blocked uh, PCs, right? And uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, if, if you went to a really good lawyer, I mean, who was really doing well, I mean, you had this very typical, uh, you know, cor in the corner of the room, and there would be this desk which had this huge PC which was eating up on 80% of the space and then there would be this, you know, if someone had to dial up, uh, you know, everyone in the room was told that no one's going to pick up the call, no one's going to make a call, you know, so th those were the times. And But I think what happened was that uh, once, uh, of course, I mean, the internet penetration overall kind of, uh, you know, uh, accelerated the pace. Uh, the IT Act of 2000, of course, made a huge impact, right? Because it uh, the uh, digitization became uh, a norm. I mean, it, it, everyone started to at least digitize the documents. E-signature got an impetus, right? So I think that was the that was the base. Thereafter, between 2005 and 2010, I would say that the internal uh, internalization of technology started to happen. I mean, that was the era during which those five years when we saw the uh, news portals, uh, you know, whether it was uh, Legally India, Bar and Bench, which, uh, which came up. Uh, then you had uh, the international publishing houses, you know, which uh, started to see opportunity within India and they made, uh, a couple of them made foray into India. Uh, juniors started to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, they started to prefer online legal research tools, vis a vis books. So that was that was the uh, that was uh, the other uh, the, the, the the next hold. Uh, thereafter, I would say 2010 to 2015. That's when technology went beyond legal research. I mean, that is when legal services were enabled by legal technology. So you know, be it uh, whether it was edtech platforms, whether it was marketplaces, which got uh, you know the clients and the lawyers together. Uh, whether uh, it was, uh, you know, um, legal jobs, legal recruiters going online, even amongst horizontal, uh, you know, something like Nokri started to focus on uh, legal per se. Within search also, uh, you know, that's when AI, ML, NLP, smart search, you know, Boolean became passing. So that was one area. And then, of course, 2015 onwards, I think we have all seen that there, there has been a complete sprint. The pandemic has, of course, changed the acceleration pace. And uh, you know whether it is e-signatures, compliance, contracts, uh, practice management. Uh, I mean, you have uh, legal incubators. You have legal innovation awards, which are happening. I mean, Agami, uh, you know, uh, organizations like Agami doing uh, work on the, uh, you know, change maker uh, for justice. So I mean, I mean, there's so much of uh, which is happening. So clearly, I mean, from very simple solutions to complex solutions is uh, is what we have seen. And clearly, I mean, I think, I think by and large, uh, I mean, even if you look at uh, people might not know that they're using technology, right? But technology is an enabler and that is where we stand today. Absolutely, absolutely on point. Um, on that note, um, I, would, I would pose my next question to Stephen. Um, just benefits of being data-driven to build trust and maintain relationships, uh, you know, um, Stephen. And we've, we've seen that uh, the, a complete overhaul in that entire system, right? Uh, when it comes to, um, we've progressed from a time where, um, just for instance, law firm partners would come back from a meeting, they would have a 
a visiting card. That visiting card would be punched in and nobody really knew what happened with that information sort of later. Um, how, has, how has the uh, entire overlooking of, of this aspect changed? And, and uh, what, do you, what would you like to say about that? Right, so hi everybody. My name is Stephen um, from Nexel. Glad to be here. Thank you for um, the invitation. Um, so right, I think um, as, as um, Priyanka mentioned, part of the changes that we've seen is that also in um, the administration of our organizations, Legal Tech has started to play a, a very important role uh, with practice management or case management systems, both within private practice, but also in, in the judicial system. Um, and um, that has kind of expanded into uh, document management systems, into CRM systems, which is, which is uh, what we do. Um, and I think um, if, if you look at it, if you take it a few steps back and you look at what's happening in the markets uh, right now, I think there's this realization that um, uh, there is so much data out there already, which perhaps we're not actually making use of. Um, and uh, so our approach and our vision uh, is really to, um, first of all, create awareness uh, of all of the data flows and all of the information that we already generate uh, when doing business, when building relationships, when you go to a conference and come back for the stack of business cards, all of these uh, use cases make it very clear that actually the way we go about these processes is, is not very efficient. We tend to uh, uh, duplicate, recreate information that in a way already exists. Um, so um, uh, again, to pick up on a point that Priyanka said, as we move from simple standalone solutions towards more complex and integrated uh, solutions, um, I think we also are starting to see um, and to realize um, that um, this integrated approach also means that we should um, better understand what's already out there and, and leverage the information and the intelligence that is kind of hidden in that information. And that is the way we do it um, uh, on, uh, with Nexel, for instance, where uh, we just um, look at um, metadata generated by interactions on the email server. I mean, that's where most of us live. Um, and then basically on um, all that information uh, on, on this information flow, we recreate profiles in an automated way. So once you understand which kind of pools of data you're looking at and you can automate certain processes, that is where a lot of the, the, the beauty starts to, to shine through. That's where a lot of insights um, uh, start to uh, become visible within the information. And I think um, a lot has to do with this shift of mindset then where you no longer start to recreate information, but basically try to read what's already in there and then develop systems around that. So that, that is one of the things I think um, that uh, we, we see a lot going on. Excellent point. Um, Anshul, coming to you, um, what are the opportunities for the legal world uh, to take the, or the tech world to actually take the load off using technology, right? Uh, um, it's it's something that we we talk about. We talk about AI. We talk about bots. We talk about um, you know easing of services at the very base level. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think uh, that's definitely a very interesting question. And you know, Priyanka rightly mentioned that uh, the pandemic has actually uh, you know acted like a catalyst uh, for legal tech to be adopted. Right. Um, so when we actually start in the legal tech domain. Uh, the focus isn't actually pitching legal tech, but the focus is pitching the ROI that a particular solution can really come in, right? Uh, to be honest, AI, ML, these are fancy words. The lawyer or the legal team, what they care about is, um, are you reducing my time? Are you able to increase my billable hours? Are you able to increase revenue, right? So, so that's, I think, the lingo that typically you would like to engage with. So a lot of interesting things, right? Like uh, if you see the shift of solutions that were there, let's say three years ago and now, it's completely different, right? So for example, at Mike Legal, uh, when we started the company, we started with uh, saying that, okay, how can we make the process of trademarks much easier, right? So we had, when we started, we had people uh, going through 8,000 pages manually flipping them to see what's similar. And we said, hey, you know, you don't need to really do that. You can actually um, use an algorithm to actually compare those trademarks. And here on the dashboard, you can see the similar infringements. So what actually ended up happening is where the associates were spending, let's say, 
two weeks, they were now spending a day on that process and they were actually able to cite 30% more uh, oppositions, which actually had more revenue. Um, similarly, for example, we have a tool around contract proofreading, which at the end of the day helps legal teams automate the process of identifying errors in the contract. So legal tech, I think what, what a lot of people have really got into is, you know, legal tech is very difficult to understand. It's very confusing. How do I really adopt it? At the end of the day, it's it's like a, um, what I like to say is it's like an associate in your pocket, right? Where you can actually use it for your mundane, manual, repetitive tasks. So you can actually have the flexibility um, to look at tasks that actually add more value to the organization, uh, you know, business development, higher client service, et cetera. So, so I think that's my outlook towards how legal tech is approached and, and the opportunities are immense, right? Because today, if you look at um, legal tech in general, from my experience, I've realized that if you're able to create a, a very good solution at a cost efficient price, legal teams are such that would actually become your customer for years and years, right? So the long time, uh, the, the, lifetime customer value is, is is actually quite high so so i think that's where a lot of interesting stuff is happening in india and even globally very very pertinent point so now just a question to all three of you um you know we 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 talk in uh, you know we often talk about products and silos and, and what can one product do for you. But just in terms of the entire gamut of, of legal tech solutions that are available today, um, would you throw some light on how um, all of these solutions, a combination of these, some of these, can actually help scale your practice, right? Uh, and, and also um, encourage your team to, um, one, innovate, um, and I think to um, strategically think about or focus on, on uh, you know, facts that, that truly need their focus, which is actually the matter uh, in question. It could be a corporate matter, it could be a litigation matter, but uh, would, you, would all three of you just throw light on, um, on those two aspects? Priyanka, why, why don't you start first? Uh, one, I would just add to what uh, Anshul said. I mean, very clearly, I mean, as uh, you know, AI, ML are very fancy words, and that's why if you really go by the poll, if you are not put in AI, ML, maybe you know, the, you would have 100% people saying that they do understand that they're using legal tech. Everyone is using it in some way or the other. Uh, coming to you know, and it's actually the use cases, which is at the end of the day, what lawyers understand. So uh, answering your question, uh, Neha here, uh, I mean, if I was just to take an example, uh, for example, I mean, Manupatra just uh, during the pandemic, we launched a practice management platform for legal team, both for corporate legal teams and uh, for uh, law practices. Now, a very simple thing of being able to find the right document at the right time, right? Or if there is an exit from the, uh, you know, from the company or from the firm, right? Someone who's been handling everything, all that, uh, archived data, the, the knowledge, you know, all of that is retained instead of going away with the person. Or if there has, uh, if in case there is no overlap between the new joinee, right? Uh, instead of reinventing the wheel each time, right? There is, there is a firm, there is a branch office in say Ahmedabad, uh, which has done a matter on something on environment. And, you know, something similar comes up uh, uh, with the Delhi branch, right? Instead of reinventing, if you have a knowledge base, which everyone within the firm can uh, can use. So reusing that data instead of each time re recreating the wheel. So very simple things. Now, uh, if I was just to take one example and take it through, you know, you you get a you get a client. I mean, we we just talked about visiting cards being scanned and uploaded, right? So fine. Even if you 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 do that bit, you go to a conference, you get your uh, you get your data, whether it is in um, you know CSV file or in uh, or a hard copy card which you scan and put in the data, you have you know that you need to chase this prospect. You know what exactly has happened at each point, who has followed up, whether it has been followed up or it hasn't. Now, tomorrow, this one converts into a client, right? Once you they convert into a client, the matter comes in, there are 15 people working on it. Each time the, uh, each time the team does not need to go and ask that, you know, who's working on this? You, you have a single unified platform which tells you that, you know, these are the people who are working on it. This is where, you know, this is the status of everything. This is the conversation which has been exchanged with me, whether uh, with the client or with, uh, within the teams. Now, if you give an extension of that to the client as well, you know, so the clients, uh, the clients, uh, you know, they're forever complaining that the lawyers are not responsive. You've got to chase them for, you know, what's happened with the case or, you know, whether an order has come in, when is the next hearing date, where do we stand, has the response been filed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if, if you give 
uh, authorized access to the client and you know basically share with the client the information that they require just think of the amount of communication that you're cutting out with, uh, so and this is a time which can then be utilized by the people for as you said whether you know more uh, whether to increase the billable hours for more innovative solutions because the moment you free up more time that's when people start to think right now you are always under the pump of you know uh, chasing the administrative matters as well you do not realize but every every whether it's an associate or a partner at each level everyone is putting in a majority chunk of time in administrative matters so at each stage Uh, very simple things but and uh, but i think the challenge which we may see is that you know over the last few years everyone has started to use um, bits and bits of solutions now today what has happened is that today um, majority again are using multiple solutions which are scattered again right so somewhere that kind of defeats the purpose of technology actually bringing in the efficiency and productivity that we want so i think what we really need is right from the beginning till the end you know and when uh, from the intake to the closure and after the closure you also archive the matter within the same platform is what you basically require got it um steven your take on it yes so i think uh, scalability in a way is a function of two things right it's it's a function of your infrastructure uh, but it's also a function of of your operational model um kind of your organizational design and so if if you ask whether and how um tech solution can 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 scale your business and your teams i think we have to look at those two things um and priyanka rightly pointed out to this idea um of unification right of uh, the different pockets and uh, isolated uh, products which really start to become um an, an a challenge for um sort of the early adopters that have uh, innovated perhaps certain uh, aspects of the business uh, that have um brought on people that uh, had a niche expertise which um they they kind of scaled through technology uh, but you really have to look at this from um a strategic perspective and from sort of a, a long term and firm wide uh, angle because otherwise you risk this fragmentation which really uh, will jeopardize um the the overall value which um you will eventually uh, create or or gain um by by the technology um and so i think Uh, when you look at that of course the arrival of um, cloud based systems really has changed the game right i think there um, we are um, now seeing a sort of an explosion of uh, of new products but but most of them um, uh, are more easily integrated than the previous generations because most of them uh, in a way are cloud based or are built on um, the ecosystem sort of infrastructure of the big big tech players and that i think also explains um what um uh, or how the success the enormous success of these huge companies uh, the microsofts and the googles of this world are getting because basically it's it's the only way to ensure a certain degree of unification in um in in your tech deployments so i think that is one um one part of the equation um uh, the other one of course uh, as i mentioned is that the, the organizational design of course uh, matters very much as well if you think about scalability um and i think there also law firms have traditionally been uh, very uh, very bad in a way they they uh, law firms are 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 uh, as everybody knows composed of uh, very autonomous independent people um uh, sometimes practice groups or practice areas with very uh, divergent uh, client bases uh, know-how systems uh, uh, networks uh, so uh, bringing this all together and make sure that um Uh, everybody is focused on uh, the right direction is is uh, a precursor to uh, creating this kind of scalability um and interesting i think in a way uh, the the software as a service model it it kind of combines both things right because the, through the 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 uh, as a service components in in lots of the things that we do um we we need to look at both that infrastructure component and um you know at the the underlying business model or organizational design if you wish as well um so those would be a couple of sort of uh, thoughts um, around scalability from my side excellent and should coming to you sure uh, so now we actually have a very different uh, i would say uh, uh, kind of like a checklist at my legal when we look at uh, scalability right 
So we, whenever we look at building a solution for the legal market, we look at few checklists, right? Is the process mundane? Is it repetitive? Is it manual? But more importantly, is it essential for the firm, right? So we typically don't want to automate any process, which let's say the law firm is doing once in two months, right? Or we don't want to automate a process that is mundane, but not really important. So what we have actually created is a checklist at Mike Legal that we typically would, would look at tasks that, uh, you know, ch uh, check these boxes because this is what is actually affecting the scalability problem, right? And I'll, I'll give you um, use cases from our own experience. So we had a boutique law firm, say six associates, um, really look at growing through the pandemic, uh, getting some really good clients. But the challenge was that they didn't have the resources to say that I can go from six associates to 30 associates, right? So they had to actually, they have to maintain the quality of work. They need to increase the work. So they need to actually put the associates, you know, more, more time of the associate. So that's where legal tech came in, where let's say our solution uh, around contract proofreading, right? So just imagine the associate previously had to go to a 50 page contract. Uh, word after word, checking if there are any inconsistencies, right? So instead of 10 crores, have you written 10 lakhs, right? Or, uh, you know, have you defined a term but not used it, right? So that previously would actually make the associate spend two or three of non-billable time. Now with our solution, that has come down to say half an hour. So that directly has affected the ROI that the firm is getting from the associate. So I think when, when we look at scalability, I think it's very important for the firm to understand what process is causing them to not scale to the level they want and then fix that because if, if you don't recognize what what the really the issue is right i just scaling the business um you won't really know what solution also to bring right there could be hundreds of solutions out there but if you don't recognize the problem it is of no consequence so typically in our experience um, of selling legal tech we've understood that law firms typically like to look at processes which are mundane manual but very very important um, that's easier to sell and that's where the question of scalability becomes easier to, to talk to them about. Okay, so, so taking a cue from that, um, Priyanka and Stephen, why don't you also put some light on the fact that um, how did the products that, that you both have, right? The products that Manupatra has and Excel has, um, how did you actually come about uh, making those products? Would, did you actually, go out to the market, understand the need, um, or was it through observation? Was it through conversation? And after the product came into being, did you actually uh, notice that the people who had posed the problem or who had, uh, you know, who had actually defined the problem were willing to take on the solutions very easily because it, it was tech-based, right? So it's, uh, and, and I'll come, I'll come back to Anshul here because in, in our experience, what we've seen um, so uh, is that you, you know what the problem is. Um, you are okay to define it. Um, but I think there's been, and, and this may be just our uh, limited experience, but it'll be good to know if um, you've seen that after, uh, you know, there's resistance to adapting uh, or adopting technology. That's, that's my broad bottom line. So uh, they may not be averse to a, uh, getting a solution to their problem, but um, even after they've defined what the solution is or what the problem is, has there been resistance at the client end? Uh, Priyanka, why don't we start with you? Many questions there. Uh, okay, uh, quickly on Manupatra, look, uh, in terms of Manupatra, there was really no, I mean, everything that we did, we pretty much you know, started from, from the scratch. Uh, I think the whole basis behind Manupatra as a legal research uh, database was that India is a litigation prone society. Uh, you know, tons and tons and tons of uh, documents being churned out every day, whether it was the uh, courts across uh, or the government, the state governments, the central government. And that's how, so that's what we said that, and, and we of course saw, we, we saw Lexus and Westlaw, what, how they were being used internationally. And we said that, you know, there definitely is a requirement for something similar in India. So that was the genesis. And of course, I mean, uh, having started with a basic search uh, Boolean, I mean, we moved on to analytics, visualization, NLP at all. And I mean, it's, and, and it's something which, uh, you know, it's, it's something which is going to evolve because uh, we believe that we have clearly seen that uh, you know the time taken on research over over the years how it is going down and how research is becoming better so it is now quality over quantity in the very early years if i just talk about 2001 when we went to the market i mean there are one or two examples 
uh, we were of course trying to meet the you know the the sitting judges to take their feedback and uh, there there weren't many who were very familiar with computer or who were willing to even you know look at something like uh, an online legal research tool so there was uh, we were lucky to have this appointment with uh, one of the sitting uh, supreme court judges who had come from the bombay high court and uh, so i mean after listening to us for 2 minutes as to what it was so he said okay i, I have something i have a test for you let's see if it happens and we'll talk further and his his uh, his law clerk had spent apparently 3 and a half hours looking for a particular judgment uh, and of course air was the was the bible and possibly was the only thing which was being used at that point of time and so he just he just uh, you know gave us he just talked about the proposition uh, and what exactly they were looking for and uh, i mean we 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 just went and used the boolean search and uh, of course internet bandwidth wasn't like what it is today but i think in about an hour and uh, one minute and 30 seconds or something he just got the exact result <clears throat> that he was looking for uh, which his clerk had spent about 3 and a half hours doing so you know so that was the first one uh, the second interesting one that i remember i mean there are many many uh, so we had <clears throat> again in the very early years uh, we had this presentation uh, in front of the sitting delhi high court judges and i think we had about 15 16 judges post uh, court hours and uh, so we started the presentation we we i mean we first showed what we wanted to and then they started to ask us give us queries and uh, we kept on finding solutions to every uh, to each of the queries which were coming and then one of the uh, honorable judges he told the chief justice that sir i think we are giving very easy ones let's give them a tricky one so the chief justice then was late uh, justice s b sena and he said okay so i i am looking for a case law which defines that whether a banana plant is a shrub or a tree okay and i remember sitting there i said okay this is it you know that this is the end of our rolling time and uh, that, and but proximity search to the rescue and the first and the only judgment which came up was a judgment by justice sena which he had given in calcutta high court right so of course one has seen that you know how i mean the the utility there is direct i mean it's it's right there uh, you have a database which it goes back to 1844 so any kind of documents so whether you're looking for a case law you're looking for a notification looking for a statute amendment report etc you know all of that is there uh, our latest product my case which is the which is a cloud based saas product which is uh, which essentially basically for a for a corporate legal teams it starts from you know uh, request uh, management right so of course we went back and we saw so over the years you know during various interactions uh, one has been getting feedback as to what are the pain points in the operations within uh, whether it is a in house uh, whether it's a corporate legal team or a law practice so with the request you know very clearly it was that the request from various departments was coming in you know either through on the phone call or there was a paper which was sent or in the lift you bumped into someone and said hey you know this is it can you just look uh, look this up for me or over the coffee machine right so i mean everything was all over and in every uh, which way possible so now we basically we start with the request management wherein you know the, the each of the departments has their own interface right so if they have a request they simply there are forms which are there for different kind of requirements so hr department or a purchase would have different kind of requirements which they are sending to legal so they have their own sorry so each department has their own set of forms they basically uh, fill up the form and they send it over the uh, over the, over the platform to the corporate legal team the corporate legal team sees all their requests they look at you know what is the nature of the request depending upon the nature of the request it is assigned to uh, uh, to one of the corporate legal team members any kind of query back and forth everything is happening over uh, all of that is linked to to that particular request so even if tomorrow if i am handling it and tomorrow if uh, you know one of you has to come and take it over the you exactly have the history of what has happened uh, once the corporate legal team has uh, you know verified that yes this is a request that they need that they are going to be working on it they have a certain due date which has been marked by the department then they can do their analysis on you know how much is it how many people who's going to be working on it how many hours you know what is the kind of uh, you know uh, uh, money that you're looking at here what is the level of uh, you know is it critical um, you know uh, the risk everything is defined right there and then it becomes a matter once it becomes a matter then you obviously everyone who's working on that matter everything is defined everyone has a view into it right and then there is an authorized access because one of the things that everyone is very uh, within uh, within the legal industry specifically privacy and security right uh, two things which are something that uh, i mean each of our demos this is a question which is asked at least five or six times you know by in, in different uh, different which ways so right from the intake 
till the you know if it is a litigation matter when is your uh, next hearing date everything is getting populated every everyone is on the same page at each point of time any kind of communication is linked so you're not going to 10 different inboxes or 10 different whatsapp or slack chats to look at you know conversations which have happened everything is bound to each respective matter Uh, whether it is a task which is assigned, whether they are the documents, the audit trail of the documents. So essentially, uh, we of course uh, answering your question. Of course, we went back. We had inputs on what were the pain points in operations. We uh, we kind of uh, did a you know high level uh, diagram which we run through uh, you know uh, people uh, the end users. And once we had the feedback on it, you know that's how you start developing. so with manu patra it was a completely different uh, story because you know there was there was no market to really go to uh, i mean it it was a concept i mean manu patra for, for initial 8 years was concept sir uh, but with my case it has been completely on the other side when people understand technology they uh, they realize that they need it uh, you know so the resistance is not as much so answering your question on resistance to change uh, manu patra was complete but so having said that uh, while people realize that they need a practice management uh, platform if, when we when we have gone to the market today it is still a concept sir because there would be a time when they will uh, when the associates or the teams will need to uh, you know run things parallelly the the regular way in which they are doing it and they will have to do uh, smaller projects or the low hanging fruits over the uh, you know the the uh, the practice management platform or using technology and once you know they have kind of uh, you know they see the results the advantages that's when they would be willing to kind of move the bigger pieces to uh, platforms like these sorry steven your take on it and experience yes so i think I think it's 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 a complex question indeed because it it kind of um, uh, touches on all of the um, steps within uh, the life cycle of, of of a tech project, a legal tech project. You start defining the problem or identifying the problem, and a lot go wrong there already, and uh, that would be a good start. But then you have the the solution building, uh, which which uh, tries to find. Um, uh, technological ways uh, to solve the question but of course these technologies need to work in the business context in uh, a, a larger framework um, and uh, and then finally um, you you talk about adoption right how do you integrate these technologies or these solutions um, and make sure that people um, actually make use of it and and um, uh, are able to uh, get to the value which it's supposed to offer um so i think it's 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 um uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it um so let me talk take me talk you through the the the, the nexel story perhaps um one of the um uh, important um i mean we're definitely working on on the commercial side of things right so nexel is a crm system um our focus uh, has been always on the issue of growth how can you grow uh, in ever more competitive markets Uh, what kind of strategies can you develop to grow your practice uh, to attract new clients um to better manage your clients and um basically create more client loyalty to to expand the uh, the value um of of uh, your your clients um across their life cycle um so that, that that's kind of our problem uh, and what we've been looking at um and um when you try to go into more detail you quickly uh, get to the point of uh, relationship building i mean in the end this is a very relationship driven industry um and any growth will always be a result of um successful human relationships uh, so for us it's really about this um uh, this relationship building uh, exercise both on an individual level where there are certain challenges that um uh, people need to meet um and then also on the institutional level where you have a complex web of relationships uh, that interact with one another um and um where the visibility on those dynamics isn't always that clear or the effects uh, aren't always that clear to everybody at the firm um so um that is definitely um around sort of the the the, the problem solution equation um and we also um invested a lot at nexel and continue to do so uh, actually um is we we 
always listen at the final client, right? We always want to make sure that um, whatever we try to develop uh, is in tune, not only with the perception uh, of the problem per se, but also with um, the, the needs at the uh, final client side. Um, so we talk a lot with corporate counsel, for instance, and uh, what they tell us is that actually, um, despite what lawyers tend to think, um, they're not always that happy, by the way, um, lawyers manage that client relationship. Uh, there's this big gap between the perception and uh, the, the, the reality. So uh, that is, that is um, uh, an important um, uh, friction point, I think, in the delivery of legal services uh, and um, a friction point that can be solved, but I think by um, you know, better uh, relationship management technology. Um, so um, when we um, think about the um, adoption challenges, um, I think the, at least in our case, um, we, we, we always try to create these aha moments, which, in, which initially uh, uh, generate a lot of interest and a lot of personal commitments to, uh, to the product per se. Um, but then we also try to be very clear um, and tell concrete stories around um, uh, sort of the, the, uh, the use cases and, and really um, try to communicate co commercial insights um, around how the solution can actually translate into value, how the solution can actually translate into better relationships, into better client management practices. Um, and um, that is, I think, uh, one, of, one of the key things one needs to keep in mind when thinking about adoption. Um, in terms of the, the um, pushback, perhaps, uh, which we have experienced, um, I think we often still need um, that idea that um, relationships are a personal thing. So these are my clients, these are my relationships, so I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do with that. Um, and uh, that is, of course, a very short-sighted uh, way of looking at um, how um, uh, a law firm, how um, a business operates. I mean, um, as I mentioned, there are these um, uh, dependencies, there are these interactions um, that one needs to take into account, uh, <clears throat> especially as uh, you you look at larger organizations with multiple offices, with multiple, multiple practice areas, where uh, it very uh, often happens. Uh, you have these siloed operations um, of different teams uh, working for the same clients but not looking at synergies, not looking at how you can sort of uh, have a more integrated, coordinated approach to uh, that relationships, uh, to that relationship to basically build and expand. Um, because if there's one thing that I think has become very clear now these days that um, uh, true collaboration pays off. Um, I mean, uh, lots of the work of, of Heidi Gardner, for instance, uh, really points out to this financial um, uh, upside to uh, a more collaborative approach uh, to a more coordinated way of uh, relationship management and relationship building. So um, uh, basically showing the numbers is also a very effective way of um, uh, making sure that people uh, connect the dots between the problem, the solution, and then what they need to do, uh, what they need to change uh, in order to benefit from those solutions. Um, why don't we run a poll before I go to answer for my next question? Let's just see if our audience knows of the barriers to legal tech. So our audience is basically a mix of, um, of course, law firm partners. We've got people from, um, you know, lawyers, associate level, um, senior lawyers. We've got um, law students as well, um, some scholars from IDIA. So um, that's the make. Give them a few more seconds to, for all of them to answer. Okay. So basically, um, what barriers to legal tech use um, does your organization face? I think um, most of it is lack of time to learn tech and lack of tech savvy users. Uh, also, um, equally, the lack of familiarity with available technology and lack of well-defined strategy. Um, 
So, Anju, my next question is to you. In terms of, you know, how how do you think leadership can actually help in implementing technology and improve process management and across the board, right? In terms of just, um, I mean, we we now have a good understanding of all the products that you all have, and, and you all have very diverse sort of products, right? Uh, which caters to a very niche requirement of uh, you know of a life cycle in a life cycle of a of a firm or an individual. All of it plays plays a massive role. Um, how do you think leadership can help implementing uh, help in implementing technology and improve process management? Sure. So I think uh, for us selling legal tech. Uh, we always try to find someone who's like a champion in the organization. Uh, it's always the best thing if it's a partner because uh, having him convince, him or her convince the organization about why they need the tool is always better, right? So yeah. so we always uh, try to engage in a conversation with the partner and, and, and uh, try to see what is going to make them tick, right? So is it more that, you know, I'm going to save your associates time, I'm going to, you know, help you increase revenue. But I think um, leadership is very, very essential because um, coming back to my earlier point, Today, if you look at the legal tech market, there are a bunch of solutions, right? For each problem, say contract management, IP management, practice management. Um, but you would still see the adoption of these softwares fairly low in the Indian law firms. It's still beginning to be there, but it's low because a lot of people don't even realize they have a problem, right? So I'll give you my example, right? So we we started with a with a contract proofreading tool, um, which basically, like you know, as I mentioned, automates contract proofreading. It's a manual task. But a lot of people weren't even aware that such a task could be automated. So they weren't even looking for a solution like that, right? So you got to um, educate the customer about that. Hey, you actually have a problem like that and this can actually be solved. So I think the leadership, the first point is problem awareness, right? That I am aware that my law firm or my organization is facing this problem um, and I need to scale. And for that, I need these solutions. And I think the second and more important part is that, um, you know, as the poll also suggested that, a lot of people don't have time to really learn the technology. And that's where leadership comes in is where, you know, you bought the tool, but you need to onboard the entire firm, right? Because if you just onboard, uh, if you just buy the tool, but you haven't activated the firm, there's no engagement, it's not going to serve anyone's purpose. So I think that's where leadership also needs to come in to say that, hey guys, um, this tool is a must for everyone to use and you need to actually spend time doing it because from a long-term perspective, it is going to bring the firm, uh, you know, a significant ROI. So I think, I think that's where leadership comes in two parts, which is first is problem awareness and second is focus on adoption. So, so that's where, from my perspective, leadership plays a huge part in, in legal tech adoption. Um, why don't I go to you, Stephen, now. Uh, how, uh, have you actually seen any difference? Uh, same question, but if you can give us instances or anecdotes from your experience um, when you're you know, when you're actually speaking to someone in India and when you're actually catering to uh, your audience in the West, uh, has there been a difference? And what's your take on just the importance of, of leadership being able to uh, understand and implement technology? Yes, of course, it's crucial. And, and um, I, I fully concur with the, the, the points raised um, uh, by Anshul. I think there's definitely very different uh, leadership styles uh, out there. Um, I don't think that one um, uh, is better than the other. Um, I think a lot uh, has to do with the vision of uh, the leadership team, not necessarily sort of the top managing partner. It can be, it can be a team or a committee, or there has to be a group uh, committed to um, basically the um, the future success of the firm and that realization that technology is going to be uh, an ever increasing part uh, in, in the mix there. Um, so um, I think there's, there's of course different, different elements that, um, that will determine the, um, the outcome uh, beyond leadership as well. Uh, you, have, you have broader sort of um, macroeconomic or socioeconomic factors that come into play. Um, when I just look across markets, uh, if, if I understand your, your question correctly, I think um, definitely um, uh, you have indicators such as um, respect for the rule of law or general um, e-competitiveness within a country like the, the um, uh, access levels to broadband internet. Um, 
uh, you know, these very basic um, uh, components, but they need to be there. And we see that in countries that have uh, gone quite far in that respect or that score very well, um, these tend to be uh, hotbeds for innovation uh, and for legal tech uh, activity. So um, there is definitely a correlation there. Um, the, um, uh, uh, you know, other elements, I think, have to do with um, the competitiveness of the, of the market as well, and I think that relates to the point that Andrew made that you need to you you need to have this problem awareness and um, problem awareness uh, tends to increase uh, alongside comp competition, right? So I think one of the things that we have seen, if we take this global perspective, because if we have clients uh, all over the world, is that um, uh, the um, activity will rise when competitive or when, when competitive competitive pressures increase. Um, so, for instance, um, I used to work in a law firm in, in Belgium um, at uh, around 2000, 2001, when there was this influx of magic circle firms in the jurisdiction, like within a span of two years, uh, Linklater's, uh, Clifford Chance, Freshfields, Ellen Overy, they had all either acquired an existing firm or they had set up an independent operation and um, they brought with them um, very different ways of thinking about the business of law, uh, new concept, more advanced technology. And that was really kind of a wake up call, uh, call for uh, local players to say, okay, we, we need to confront this pressure. Um, so we need to think about strategies that can um, make sure that we remain competitive and we don't lose too much business to these new players. So um, that, that kind of uh, dynamic is, I think, uh, one of the triggers that will then uh, allow leadership uh, within law firms to come through with more ambitious plans, with bolder visions, uh, with um, uh, basically... Um, uh, proposals that will shake up the status quo, which uh, tends to be um, a sort of very, uh, you know, comfortable position uh, where most law firms uh, tend to find themselves into. So that kind of uh, competitive uh, wake-up call is, is crucial for leadership to uh, come through with um, more innovation, more ambitious proposals, including more investment in technologies. Um, and then, of course, um, the momentum and sort of the political capital that these uh, leaders uh, have that needs to be translated into uh, real, uh, I would say pressure, but also recipes for adoption. And then we come back to our earlier point, like how do you um, uh, force people uh, to use uh, the technologies? And I think force is never gonna be a, a great idea. So there, I think leadership needs to work around purpose. I think that is one of the key words, I think, um, uh, people will only change when uh, they understand the purpose and the benefits of that change. Um, I always tend to remind myself of um, this scene in The Matrix. I don't know if you if you saw uh, those movies, but at some point, Neo is talking to one of the guys in the in the underground city, and they're looking at the machines, and and the guy tells an interesting story about you know actually. Um, I don't understand how this all works, but I understand the purpose of what's going on here. Um, and that purpose is, is so much more important than technical understanding. I think the learning process needs to be there. Of course, you need um, uh, uh, training sessions, you need um, people that will help uh, uh, people to overcome their initial uh, fears around integrating technology in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, but it has to be preceded by that um, vision, by um, a, a really purpose-built uh, approach to, to, to legal tech. Um, otherwise, it's going to be a tricky, a tricky game. That's a good point. Um, Priyanka, your take on, on the same question? I think both Anshul and Stephen have pretty much uh, summarized it. Um, I think one is, of course, uh, Digital, uh, the I mean, any any business needs to first define what digital means to them, because it would mean different to different people, you know, to their operations, to what they're, and as Anshul said, I mean, they need to first understand what do they need it for, right? So, it, so first define what it means to you. Next comes in, of course, the strategy as to, you know, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And thereafter, uh, you know, why? The why needs to be defined and the why needs to be communicated to everyone across 
because you know you can't just presume that we have decided four people have decided that this is going to be done and this has to be done if you don't buy you if you don't get a buy in from the team you know it's it's a non starter so uh, it's 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 a, uh, a precursor which uh, to any uh, adoption of technology or any tool however big or small i mean you need to have a buy in from the team and all of this has to be led from the top and so to that extent i think adoption of technology is of course about technology uh, you need tech you need to be tech savvy you need some champions but it is equally about people and then well, you know the points which anshul and steven uh, just shared that you know making that time to train the to train the team to tell them you know how what i mean you can't expect that you know you you got to be doing regular work which is happening at the same time you got to learn this there has to be some kind of a balance right i mean uh, i mean there, there are different ways of putting it across which i think again you know it would depend upon the kind of group of people that you are addressing so completely a cultural change uh, which has to be which uh, and a cultural change can only be led from the top where in digital first is in a way you kind of make it as a part of your dna part of the dna of the team you know how to improve processes and constantly keep on doing it because there is no cut off date to that i mean with technology whatever we are using today tomorrow will be something else so you know you you got to evolve so it's not only about just this product or this tool there would be a different version of the tool that you're using today so clearly i mean uh, without without the leadership buy in without the leadership leading it uh, you know so i think i think what um, uh, anshul uh, just mentioned that the way they are approaching it i mean that's that's a way to do it because yes i mean for uh, uh, coming couple of years i mean all of this is especially in india it is it will continue to be a concept cell and uh, there's no way that you can start from um, you know from from below and move up correct so on that note we have a we have a very pertinent question here um i think it's from uh, dipreet uh, kaur who's a student who says that how can we as first generation lawyers um access the tools that help us hone our skills that are required for every law firm or any job for that matter because first um of all in many law schools here we don't have access to those to these databases and because digitally speaking it's a it's a major issue uh, we face so i mean that's at a fundamental level right um denying access to law students at the law school level right is is uh, you're not able to make the understanding very clear at the law school level right so for them to suddenly transition into lawyers who understand the importance of um, you know being a digitally savvy lawyer is taken away any any experiences there uh, i i know steven this may be a little off uh, thing because it, it, this is most mostly pertaining to indian law schools but anshul priyanka any any take uh, on that um, anshul why don't you go first you want to go first sure priyanka go ahead no i thought if you want to go first okay fine i'll go ahead yeah. uh, i think that's a that's a very interesting question i i think uh, a lot of legal tech companies now have started to uh, kind of like give discounts or give free access to students uh, right so so you know i feel at a law, the law school management needs to put this forward because um, today right if i take manu patra's example you can't have anyone join a law firm not knowing uh the best ways how to how do you use manu patra right because right. you you can't expect someone to be training in the form that okay this is how you use manu patra right or for example in our case um you know if person is joining an ip form for example how to use uh you know the trademark search tool in the best way these are things that uh, you know law students need to know today because that is how they'll become lawyers of the future right if 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 they are doing the same methodologies what they were doing 10 years ago and then expecting that suddenly you join a law firm that's where you get open to technology it creates a huge gap right and that's where the problem again comes in that you know i don't know how to use technology in the best way that's where a lot of times legal tech companies fail because even though solution is really good uh, the user does not know how to best use it and that's where the roi doesn't come so i, I think uh, it's very very important i think a lot of companies now have started to provide discounts so if the uh you know law school is not providing definitely recommend law students to actually see if they can do it on an individual basis because it definitely gives them an edge uh over the other candidates also okay. priyanka your take 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, in terms of legal research tool, I can definitely say about Manupatra that in case your college uh, is not subscribing uh, directly and you don't have, do not have access, uh, we have uh, sessions which keep on happening from time to time, wherein we also give hands-on training uh, to the uh, to the students who sign up for these, uh, you know, whether these are webinars or training sessions or workshops that we do. So you can always, uh, I mean, follow us on LinkedIn and you'll, you'll get the news. That's one part of it. Uh, in terms of, I think there's been a lot of, uh, I mean, lately one has been seeing a lot of uh, talk about uh, the syllabus uh, being, uh, to, to include legal tech in the syllabus uh, of the colleges. So I think now that uh, the conversations have started, uh, one can hope, you know, so there is that awareness uh, for sure. So one can see something happening. Uh, the next is that, I mean, there's so many webinars uh, and workshops, et cetera, which are happening and majority are free, right? And even and even if they're paid, you know, it's, it's worth uh, going and spending, making that investment because these are pretty small tabs that we're talking about. So I think uh, in uh, participating in uh, all of these uh, online workshops and uh, webinars would uh, definitely, uh, you know, and plus then you have many courses being given by the, you know, likes of Coursera's and Allison's, et cetera. Uh, which can definitely so you know just keep on adding brick by brick to your knowledge and uh, i think that would uh, that would at least give you a give you a base to start off from yeah i, I think just adding two cents there um um this Preet, um you were the one who asked the question so uh, if your college is not um, already subscribing it's I think it's it's very surprising because I mean I went to law school in 2002. Um, I would understand at that point there were barely any solutions available, but we still had Manupatra, and and it'll be it's very um, um, it's very pertinent that all the students get together and write to the management and make sure that you get the subscription um, going. If that's not possible, and if you've already tried that, then maybe. Uh, a good way to approach it is what Priyanka said. Uh, there is a, a lot happening right now. Uh, follow the right people, follow the right companies on LinkedIn. Um, just, I think by doing that, uh, by covering uh, that basic, very basic step, uh, you will become aware of a lot of things that are happening. Um, and I think it is it is uh, worth your time, um, you know, just enrolling for courses that upskill um, you in terms of research skills, writing skills, and there are many, many service providers out there. Uh, so just just know that, that you need to invest your energy and time in, in, into this space if the college is not uh, doing that for you. Um, so yeah, that's those are my two cents. I'll go on to my next question. Um, so there's been a massive debate about, uh, you know, how AI and technology bots um, are going to be, okay, we have, I, I'll stop there. I think there's one more question that's come. Um, Post-COVID, what are the pain areas which a corporate legal team um, is facing today? And what tech tools are solving this problem? Um, it's from Matthew. Um, Stephen, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, well, I think, um... Uh, COVID has done many things, right? Uh, it has acted as a catalyst, as uh, we already mentioned in this conversation. It has sped up a lot of um, processes that were already ongoing, but sort of put a booster on, on, um, on those changes in the marketplace. Um, I think one of the main issues um, which we will see uh, in the longer term is um, around um, on-the-job training, if you wish, um, and the transmission of um, uh, certain skills and relationships, um, which uh, tend to occur better in person than uh, on a virtual level. Uh, I think that um, it's not entirely clear yet um, how the post-COVID world will look like, because I think we haven't reached um, the, the end of the pandemic by any, any means uh, at all. So um, a lot will depend on the way um, uh, firms and corporate legal departments um, will organize their legal teams uh, going forward, whether um, that will be sort of a mix of remote and um, uh, in-office um, uh, operations. Um, I think uh, definitely uh, from our perspective, um, one of the key challenges uh, in this environment is how can you um, uh, create um, long lasting 
uh, intimate relationships and build trust across these digital platforms. And I think that is uh, a very important challenge um, where I think technology can, can uh, offer a way to help us, um, even uh, if uh, it is from a distance or even if it's uh, on, on Zoom calls, etc. There are definitely strategies where um, the uh, exercise of relationship building and caring and relationship management can benefit from technology. And uh, we tend to associate uh, technology with this kind of cold-hearted uh, approach uh, to, to relationships. I think at Nexel, um, we, we strongly believe in the opposite. Um, I think that um, technology can offer people uh, ways to uh, develop better, closer, stronger, uh, hum more humane relationships. Um, and that is through very um, sometimes simple tools. We, um, one of our popular features, for instance, in Nexel is um, uh, what we call the stay in touch reminders. You know, uh, our brain is just not wired um, to uh, keep track of all of the uh, important people that we talk to and sort of the, the way time uh, evolves is it's, it's very different. So we try to give people access to tools that allow them to stay closer to uh, their most valuable contacts, to stay on top of relationships, to make sure that people don't drift away simply because um, we forget about uh, reaching out. Um, so these kind of simple things um, might be potentially uh, solving that, that issue. Um, but then again, you know, the, the, um, the idea of um, diversity, I think, is also a crucial thing. Uh, diversity and cross-pollination uh, only really occurs in certain social settings um, that are just very difficult to replicate uh, in a virtual environment. And uh, I think one of the uh, defining competitive features of law firms going forward is kind of that cognitive diversity and that ability to mix talents and to, make, to mix um, people from different backgrounds with very different skills. Um, in particular, the sort of the marriage between uh, the legal brains and the technology people, I mean, it's, it's super difficult to achieve. We see that all the time. Uh, you, um, they really speak different languages very often. And uh, law firms that don't invest in a culture where this cognitive diversity is embraced, um, they, will, they will fall behind because they will not have the capacity, the institutional capacity to uh, adopt uh, innovations in the marketplace and put them at work uh, for the benefit of, of their clients. Um, so uh, it's, it's a challenging uh, time. I think um, uh, there's yet uh, still a lot to be, to be seen as to what the final effects will be of, of this pandemic. Um, but um, yeah, we always go back to um, relationship building, collaboration, uh, uh, strong and clear lines of communications with your key stakeholders that is going to be um, an essential part in, in any kind of context. Um, so coming, coming to my, um, my next question, um, there's been a lot of debate about uh, you know, when we talk about technology, um, and, and I think we've, I've seen that in the, in the publication world especially. So you talk about the importance and relevance of technology, and um, you talk about um, you know, different products that are available. And um, suddenly, on day three, there is an article about uh, you know the threat people feel about technology bots and AI taking over um, the legal careers, um, the fact that they will replace us all, and um, you know it's and and a lot of resistance there because this is sort of a perception that's been created. Um, would you like to bust that myth completely? Because I mean, we understand that we we know that 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 doesn't happen. That's not the intent of legal tech. The uh, nobody can um, actually take away from the you know human to human interaction. Um, but what technology actually does is just uh, free up your time to make sure you focus uh, mostly on uh, you know matters that, that are truly of significance when it comes to scaling of business, when it comes to uh, you know, um, researching for relevant uh, sort of case laws. Um, also, you know, just this basic basics of just everyday operation. Anshul, would you, would you like to take that first? Yeah, Neha, so I think you've put it quite uh, well. Uh, my opinion is that you, this, this thought that legal tech or AI is gonna take up my job, 
usually comes from lack of understanding of legal tech right uh, i think if any lawyer feels that they're going to take my job i think then the lawyer really needs to retrospect about what they're doing right because at the end of the day if you look at any technology right uh, using ai ml anything these are all just to um, help the lawyer get to better tasks right and if the lawyer feels that you know they they don't want these solutions they want to hold it back um you know the, the sad part is in the next few years they will get disrupted right because a lawyer with technology will overpower a lawyer with no technology right so if you look at any solution from practice management case law research uh, you know contract proof reading ip management these are all geared towards helping associates take better decisions um, so we always like to say that you know we're like an associate in your pocket right give us the mundane task and we will give you uh, you know data in the fastest way possible so you can make better decisions you can provide better client service and actually scale so i think is this as simple as that right like the technology is there to help you not to take your job i think if i was to add i mean yes technology is purely an enabler it's not here i mean they're just there to you know complement what you're doing to bring about more efficiency and greater productivity uh, at the same time i think the uh, top management or whoever is leading the adoption uh, needs to still have this realistic outlook and kind of you know from time to time address these issues of the team because everything said and done i mean these are these are very natural uh, feelings which people have i mean uh, Y2K was a time. I mean, I was part of the banking industry at that point of time when this whole Y2K thing had happened, and uh, I still remember. I mean, I was just uh, you know fresh into job at that point of time, and yet uh, it 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 was such a thing that as if you know people, as if uh, there there would be millions and millions of people who who would be losing the job because of this whole com- computerization thing. But all it did was it increase the number of jobs. Exactly. so i think so, so i think it's about being uh, what technology is here to do is to help you utilize your time better do something more meaningful something that you have been trained to do do something which is more subject specific and it is here to essentially take care of the repetitive work the rote work you know and so so that is it's it's basically there as a friend and it's not a foe i mean that's something which everyone just kind of needs to remember even your team Yeah, I I fully agree with with the points uh, made here. Uh, I think um, uh, in a way uh, we all have to reinvent ourselves all of the time. I mean that is that is um, part of the modern world. That is part of the the the, the dynamics in um, uh, the current business environment. Uh, we um, cannot keep on doing uh, what we used to do. Uh, we need to. uh leverage the benefits and the efficiencies that tech new technologies can bring us uh, and and scale up i mean uh you know the the the, t- the classical um value pyramid of uh, professional services um is is there for everybody to see and uh, it's up to the the lawyers themselves to climb that ladder and um you know in a way i think that um some of the menial tasks of um Uh, more junior lawyers or business professionals uh, in law firms will be automated away. There's no doubt about that. I mean, if you look at what we do at Nexel, um, uh, as early as as maybe five six years ago, um, I, I deployed uh, CRM projects where we used to hire data stewards to sort of deduplicate information to. Uh, uh, updates and harmonize uh, databases and, and contact lists. Um, Nexel has really automated away these kind of jobs, so they're no longer there. So in a, in in a way, that is not um, it is not such a vain threat um, as as it may appear. And I, I fully agree to to um, your view, uh, Neha, that that in the end, um, robots will not take over. Um, but there are certain uh, tasks and there are certain functionalities or functions within uh, organizations um that uh, will disappear or um that uh will become less valuable and so it's up to the people that occupy those positions that perform these tasks and duties to rethink what um they do and how they can add value to the business uh, and there's plenty of way uh of ways to move up you know to to uh to uh, scale up to reinvent what you do to uh, reassess the value you contribute to the organization and i think people need to discuss that um i think one of the key 
um, uh, uh, factors uh, to achieve successful organizations in this new digital era is creating uh, spaces for people to converse about these things. Um, the, the issue is that um, we've often um, come to believe that IT is a department, uh, that it is a select group of people that um, are specialized in it uh, so that the rest of the firm doesn't have to care about that. And I think that has proven to be uh, a very, very uh, wrong way of looking at things. Um, technology is something that concerns us all. Uh, and we need to open up, we need to understand the basics of what's going on. We don't need to understand the machines again, but we need to understand the impact uh, the machines have on the way we organize our business, on the way we uh, manage our firms, uh, on the way we deliver our client services. Um, and then um, it's up to everybody to uh, create their own path uh, to see opportunities um, and also uh, certain threats that I think uh, in some places are, are quite real. Uh, Neha, if I can just add a quick point here, I think what uh, Priyanka mentioned uh, was quite interesting because a pattern that we have seen is that a lot of law firms now, uh, at least, you know, the tier one firms have started to uh, create a position of CIO, right, Chief Information Officer, where one of the main tasks is to actually look at what type of technology needs to be onboarded. So, so I think legal tech is not just going to, you know, help uh, people do better tasks, but also create, you know, new job opportunities. Absolutely. So I think I think we completely agree there uh, with all of you. And Stephen, very, very pertinent point that, yes, some jobs are definitely going to be, become redundant, right? Because um, I think the importance of technology is that uh, a lot of the mundane tasks can be automated. And um, it doesn't take away from the, from the you know, uh, value add of the person. But I think uh, like you rightly said that, you know, you need to, the person needs to understand uh, how are you adding value, right, uh, to that particular job. And uh, accordingly, upskill, upgrade yourself, and, and that's how you stay relevant, because I think it's it's true for everyone, right? So, uh, for instance, I, I, I still remember, I'm, I'm, I hope it has changed, but what I saw at firms even three to four years back is to send out, uh, you know, or, or to check for conflict when a matter comes in, um, you were sending an email uh, to a bunch of 300, 400 lawyers. And basically what you're doing is you're waiting for them to respond. Now, something as simple as conflict check, um, it's not, it, it doesn't take a lot of time for you to send out that email, but then you're actually uh, waiting to act on that mandate or matter that's coming or an inquiry that's coming, an RFP that you could be working on, um, only because you've spent two whole days working, uh, waiting uh, to hear from each partner saying, you know, it's it's clear, there's no conflict. You know, it's, it's something as basic as that. And so... Um, it, it may not, AI may not create a job for someone to be checking conflict uh, there, but it'll actually help you save that time because you'll be able to check conflict very, very quickly. So something as basic as that, right? Um, and and um, like you yeah, said- you know, If I'll add to that, you know, because you mentioned conflict management. So, you know, this is what we do in my case that you know precisely you just go and put in and we are not only it's not only the company name or the director's name we are also carrying the you know the spouse's name or you know the first relation so that you exactly know you go and you just search so instead of you you spend that five minutes or ten minutes putting in different uh, you know options and you just see whether you've already handled something or some other branches handled and so yeah so your two days have been saved and another matter on legal research, if I would, you know, so a lot of, uh, I mean, there are many legal research databases today and everyone is talking about using AI and ML. But what that is basically doing is what AI and ML does is that it gives you more specific results, re relevant results. But at the end of the day, it is the individual who is going to be looking at those and saying that, you know, this is the one that I'm going to be using. This is the one really which applies to, uh, applies to me. It is not technology which is really making that. So obviously humans are not being replaced at all. Um, maybe just to pick up on, on those points as well, I think um, there are still so many opportunities to do things uh, more efficiently. And I think the, 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 the use case of conflict check is, is very on point. But um, sometimes it's even uh, 
uh, more menial stuff, if I see sometimes how people lose time scheduling meetings, uh, whilst we have things like Calendly and, and these very easy, uh, super um, uh, easy to use and understand and often free uh, tools to, to basically uh, do those processes more efficiently, I still wonder why people are not using it more. Um, there is still, I think, a big opportunity for the legal sector to do much more with these tools. When I look at it from our perspective, for, for instance, we, um, we often look at business planning processes. This is also something which is um, still something considered um, from sort of an analog uh, point of view, because people then don't tend to think that there's technology that can help you um, do strategic planning or, or business planning. But there is, and, and there are so many uh, tools available now around uh, objective setting, the whole, um, uh, I think, narrative of OKRs and how you can uh, sort of manage by objectives that hasn't permeated in legal uh, at all, at least uh, from what, what we've seen. Uh, and, and when we ask, uh, you know, what are your plans? What are your business plans? You know, they refer to some kind of word document uh, and, and nobody really knows where it is. And let alone that there's any process around uh, managing results or outcomes, uh, a regular follow-up, um, sort of alignment uh, of objectives of the different uh, teams within the firm. Um, there's really easy to use tools out there um, that can um, really change the nature of those practices and really improve uh, the efficiency of, of, of these processes. So um, still a lot of uh, room and opportunity uh, to do better, I would say. Um, now, just to just to sum it up, um, can we have three uh, tips that that you all may have? Um, it could be pertaining to product. It could be pertaining to adaptability of, of technology. Uh, just the entire universe of legal tech, maybe. Um, um, Anshu, do you want to go first? Sure. I think the first tip, and I've spoken about this quite a bit, is uh, problem awareness, uh, both from the legal tech side and the legal team side, right? So we as a company uh, who's building the product need to be aware what type of problem we're trying to solve, um, who is the customer at the end of the day, what value we're creating. And uh, for the legal team, <clears throat> the manager or the partner needs to be aware about um, what's the bottleneck that's that's uh, you know that's causing him not to really scale to the level he, he or she wants. So, you know, what type of problem he's facing, uh, what solution needs to come in. I think the second bit is uh, successful onboarding. Right. So uh, one of the challenges we've seen in legal tech is typically solutions who take much more effort in training or setting up uh, tend to have a lower adoption rate compared to, uh, let's say, something like, you know, at, at a click of a button, you can you can get the detailing. Um, so from someone who's building a legal tech company, recommendation would always be that look at how you can reduce the onboarding time and can actually give results faster. And uh, from a partner's perspective, you know, the focus is that you need to put your foot down and get the firm to onboard the solution, um, activate everyone, because only then you'll see ROI, right? So it's not just on the legal tech company, but on you also uh, to actually have a successful, uh, you know, onboarding and activation. And I think the third very interesting thing is budgeting for legal tech, right? How do you really budget for legal tech? So um, in our experience, uh, what we tend to tell clients is the ROI that we can give them, right? So if let's say they're spending, uh, you know, a lakh on an associate per month, uh, we're able to reduce uh, the associate's time at 20%, save them that much money, um, you know? So so that's the type of conversations we have. So um, a lot of firms today who are not even aware of legal tech to budget for legal tech is very difficult. So the easiest way to look at it is, is look at it from a form of investment uh, for the future scalability of the company. Right. So it's not like you have to fire someone or you need to, uh, you know, let someone go, but it's more about uh, what's the investment required to get the solution that can help you uh, get a 20% increase in revenue, 30% increase. Um, so those would be, you know, few pointers from my end. Uh, Priyanka, you want to go next? Uh, so I would say that from a, you know, because there is a lot of talk about practice management tools today, uh, when you're looking at, uh, you know, solutions, do not look at multiple small bits of solutions. Look for one single solution as far as possible so that, you know, you're not jumping from tool to tool, app to app and software to software. 
because uh, if you do that then you know i mean uh, one tends to kind of say let's just get started and possibly adopt multiple tools then few months or uh, some time down the line you're looking at trying to integrate all of them which means that you're spending more time and more money on that instead you know so obviously going back to what anshul was saying that you know first identify what is your problem area so take few steps back plan it out identify what are your pain areas you know what kind of technology or technology enabled tools can help you so take it as a plan don't just jump into it just because you're under the pump to you know adopt technology so there has to be that has to be the first step uh, on the legal research part uh, you know after all these years what i would suggest is that when you are looking at a legal research tool i mean you have to now look at uh, you know the relevancy of searches that you get because at the end of the day you need to be researching smarter and faster right so, so look at the tool that you're taking uh, how fast is it and fast uh, fast does not come only with bandwidth or uh, it is it is you know how cross uh, how cross referenced your uh, the database is uh, forward referencing backward referencing whether it tells you it's good law or bad law when you get results instead of you trying to look uh, look for it how hyperlinked it is i mean you have a document that you're reading it has references to you know uh, many primary and secondary references does it take you directly to that uh, does it take you to the section 138 or does it take you to the section 1 of the act you know small bits but every every bit counts and it makes your uh, research faster so these two bits from me um sure thanks i think so many good tips already uh, shared here so um when when i would think about um sort of the key factors that um, have influenced the um, level of success of legal projects I've witnessed or I've participated in, I would um, definitely um, go towards um, internal communication. I think that is a, a function that is highly underestimated in uh, many law firms, uh, precisely because of the fragmentary nature of those organizations um, and the psychology of, of lawyers that tends to, that tends to be um, Uh, focused on on the individual uh, that tends to be inwards so i think um, having a platform uh, to, to share um, uh, information having uh, a strong internal communication function is is crucial to the success of uh, technology uh, deployment per se um, uh, we always my my first one of my first questions so when we go into law firms with a project is okay who who is in charge of internal communications because it is so crucial uh, to have this this kind of uh, um, uh, line towards uh, the rank and file within the firm who in the end do the job and very often um, our key messaging uh, goes to the um, uh, the leadership and sort of a core team of people that drive the project but the success of the project will depend on on the others as well and so if you if you don't have a way to reach out to them to Uh, also get feedback uh, from them uh, to tweak and to adjust where necessary i think um, uh, it's going to be it's going to be tough um, another thing that we we usually advise is um, involve your your clients in whatever strategic projects that you uh, that you deploy um, it's it's very important to um, remain wary of the final outcomes and of the final added value that is created by these solutions for the client. We don't do this uh, just for the sake of, of ourselves or, or the, the people within the firm. So why don't we just converse with those uh, people uh, from the very onset of the project? Uh, so we advise to basically invite uh, core clients to discuss this project, to get their point of view, to get their vantage points. Um, and we usually get very interesting results from that. Um, and it keeps um, it, it keeps our eyes on the ball. Um, I think um, uh, that is that is a crucial um, a crucial element. Um, we even have have examples of um, I just worked on a project in Latin America where um, a firm really um, did kind of legal hackathon sessions uh, where they involved clients to collaboratively think about new solutions. And um, I think that um, for many tech Uh, or legal tech solutions, this kind of collaboration and co-creation uh, can really um, uh, have a big impact. Um, and then finally, I think I would go back to a point I already made around um, this, um, the importance of a clear objective setting, right? We need to uh, align our visions around um, the, um, the business objectives that we try to achieve 
Um, we need to think about how people can um, uh, contribute with very um, bite-sized, actionable uh, steps um, in, in towards the um, uh, the realization of that vision. Um, so, uh, in any business and in any project, clear objective setting is is also going to be very important. Point, uh, one of you. Thank you so very much uh, for keeping it crisp. Uh, uh, for keeping it very, very relevant. Um, I will just take a few moments to open up uh, the Q&A section if there are any questions. Uh, we've got some um, good comments. People have said, excellent talk. Thank you so much for all the information and insights, which is great. Um, Nivedita says, enjoyed this session and found all the information extremely useful. Um, that's great. Um, if you... If all the participants have any questions, please post them now um, in the in, in the Q&A section or the chat box, whatever is convenient. More than happy to unmute you guys uh, if you want to ask the question yourself. Um, nothing yet so i'm guessing no questions um please feel free to um, connect with um, all of our speakers on linkedin if you have particular questions you want to ask them um and um thank you very much for logging in on a sunday morning uh, and doing this um thank you to all our speakers thank you for sparing the time thank you for being just just very very authentic and honest about your views um, and thank you to all the participants. We have a small uh, feedback form in the chat box uh, that we post now. If you could just spare two minutes uh, filling that up, uh, it'll help us. Um, and we'll end that session uh, on that note. We've got a couple of more comments saying very interesting, informative session, sir and ma'am. Happy Teacher's Day. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, great session. Those are the comments that you've got. Thank you, Neha. I mean, this was brilliant. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Neha, for setting this up. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks for the invitation, Neha. Thanks, Angela and Stephen. Great. Thanks, Bye, Angela. Angela. Thanks, Stephen. Great connecting with you guys. Yeah. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Bye.